Good day to everybody. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming to my talk. I'm going to talk about transitioning into quantum computing from outside of physics, computer science, and, and whatnot. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, my talk is titled, You're Doing What Now? Which I get that a lot. <laughs> so it's about how curiosity leads to unexpected and exciting opportunities. And I am the IBM Quantum Academic Partner Technical Lead. And I'm also an IBM Quantum Technical Ambassador. I've got several different titles. It's not the first time I've held more than one position or had a whole bunch of different titles, if you can see my slides. Um, this slide just shows some of the different titles. These are like official titles that I've had over my lifetime. Um, the two current ones are the ones in, in dark blue. Uh, I also answered to mom. I have been a senior R&D chemist. I have been an HTML programmer, technology transfer intern, client developer advocate. In addition to you know, being a PhD student graduate research fellow, I've also done volunteer instructing, tutoring. I've done volunteer positions in the community like walking dogs for the Humane Society. <laughs> I've done a little bit of everything. And when I was a student, I often held multiple jobs all at one time. Uh, so like when when I was an undergraduate, I was a student copy editor. I was an HTML programmer, tech support admin, answering the phones and sending out jobs uh, for the different technicians. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I was a tutor, research assistant, um, it, it, multiple different things all at one time. And I've, I've kept that going. Um, so, for example, keep doing different things, uh, not just the one thing that I'm supposed to be doing, but doing a lot of other things. I mean, you can probably guess you do something like this, too. Right. I mean, we're women. We do more than it is, it is expected. Um, so just to kind of give you a, a talk about how I got started and where all of this has occurred. I started college when I was 16, so I've kind of had a little bit of extra time to squeeze more in, <laughs> but I didn't know what to, what I wanted to do with myself at that time, like every teenager on the planet, right? I mean, you, you think you know what you want to do, and then it changes the next week as soon as you find something else new and interesting. And so by the time I went to my, my major institution for, my, for the bulk of my undergraduate work, um, which I, I started off at the Texas Academy of Mathematics and Science uh, at the University of North Texas in, in Denton, Texas. And I went to Texas A&M University to finish out my undergraduate. I held several, several different majors and to the point that at one point, my parents uh, said, just pick something and figure out what you want to do with yourself later. Well, OK, sure. <laughs> so um, the the courses that I took, a lot of them uh, just had a, a whole bunch in common with microbiology, which is what I graduated with with my bachelor's in, you know, like mechanical drafting and engineering physics and computer science. And that has a lot in common. Right. Not, not really. Um, but you never know when any, you know, when, when something, I'd be curious about something. I'd take a course. I had the opportunity to do so, and they would count as my electives. And I found in my career later that all of these courses were actually really useful. And as I would take courses in different disciplines, uh, I would see that there were commonalities between the, the foundational layers of all these different possible majors, right? Okay, so I ended up again with that with that bachelor's in microbiology, still not knowing what I really wanted to do, uh, and I applied to a lot of different graduate programs: geology, uh, microbiology, molecular biology, and I went to there's a standalone master's program between the University of Texas Health Center at Tyler and Stephen F. Austin State University, and this is a standalone biotechnology research focused master's degree. There's no PhD, it's just straight up master's program. And it is very much, it was very intensive as far as laboratory work. We, I can tell you, I can understand a ton of different biotechnology techniques from the hands-on perspective, what it's doing on the scientific level and everything. This was a just a wonderful program, but I really wasn't just excited about working in the lab, like hands-on experimental work. 
just really wasn't exciting to me. It's interesting. And it's great to have that knowledge about all those techniques. You analyze papers and, and critically read pe journal articles and move your work forward. But I just, I, I really liked computers. I I have had a computer from a very young age. I had taken programming and I didn't know that there was an opportunity to actually merge those two fields until one of my professors at the University of Texas Health Center, uh, Health Science Center at Tyler he had an opening for a student and he was uh, working with computational biochemistry. I thought, well, that takes these two things. Oh, oh, I can use one to solve problems in the other. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, do you have an opening? And he needed, and he did. And so I started on about 10 years of, of work with research, both my master's and my PhD work, studying large molecules of RNA that are not the usual ones you read in a textbook. They're non-canonical RNAs that function in some sort of alternative method of protein synthesis. Um, a, lot, a lot of these are drug targets or, or opportunities to be drug targets, both in bacteria and viruses. And I got to use a computer to do all of this. So this was really, really exciting uh, to me and, and really got kind of this inspiration to move forward. So already I was using different things that I had already learned um, so to, from, you know, all these different things, all these different positions that I had held previously informed what I was doing right then and there. So I, I have a bunch of papers, uh, studying these different RNAs or, or publishing databases, uh, of different sequences, doing sequence analysis, molecular modeling in three dimensions. And it was really exciting, but at the same time, towards the end of this, when I was working on my PhD at Auburn, um, the uh, I, I realized I don't know if I really want to go into a career in academia. And you'll this is probably a common theme that you're hearing from a lot of people. And, you know, they, they want something a little bit different. Well, I took an, an internship after I finished my Ph.D. with the Auburn University Technology Transfer Office, where in the, the way I got into this, I was considering um, I I'd had a class at, at UT with they had to do a technology transfer. And what, what that worked with is the patent process, licensing, things like that. And I thought, well, maybe that's an opportunity. Let me, let me inquire about that. I set up an informational interview with the university patent attorney and walked away with an internship. And I did patent analysis, prior art searches. And I also learned about licensing contracting and chased down a lot of inventors for signatures on declarations and assignment paperwork. <laughs> Hey, you're an intern. You got to learn something, or you know, you got to learn somewhere, right? And all of that put together, I thought, well, maybe I want to be a patent agent. Um, I had the opportunity to be an assistant professor at Northwestern State University in Louisiana, uh, and I taught there for a couple of years. I thought, okay, well, I'm still maybe going to go in a patent agent uh, kind of direction. I was still studying for the patent bar. Um, but when you're teaching 17, 16, 17 contact hours, it, it, you don't have much time. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, but I still managed to squeeze in some classes in multivariable calculus. My students looked at me like, what are you doing in this class? I'm curious. I want to learn too. And okay, Dr. B. All right, sure. <laughs> so I was taking undergraduate courses to get a foundation in that math and really grow my knowledge of math, uh, in addition to teaching. So that was, that was a kind of a funny experience. Um, towards the end of my, my teaching, I, I actually got the opportunity to jump into industry as a senior R&D chemist. And if you look at the name that's next to Northwestern State, that doesn't have anything to do with biochemistry, does it? <laughs> no, I went to Halliburton and was in the oil and gas industry for about three and a half years. And the commonality between biochemistry and oil and gas chemistry, it, you know, it all has to do with intermolecular interactions. So if you're if you're wondering and 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 I will actually telling this kind of career path, I actually lose some people. Um, the you have to think about each thing that you learn, each thing that you're working on. How does that transfer to another industry? How does that how how is that interesting? What what can what's in common there? So looking at how molecules interact with each other, that's biochemistry, right? 
uh, how, you, how drugs interact with proteins, how proteins interact with your RNA, or how everything works with your DNA, um, how things are transcribed. All of it is intermolecular interactions. So transferring that fundamental knowledge to another discipline and being able to put that to use, that's how I got that job. Uh, they asked me, well, how would, how would you use what you know to solve this kind of a problem? And I came up with something on the fly in the interview. And uh, from manager feedback, that is what sparked their interest. And I actually had the job very early on in the interview process. They just, uh, you know, so um, I, I did that. I invented, I loved inventing. I loved teaching people internally about what we were doing and, and then they could take those techniques that and workflows that helped develop and use those in field locations. So I found out I love traveling and I went all up and down North and South America training field locations and meeting those new people, finding out how they were using things, getting their feedback, improving processes. It was great. I loved it. Um, but at the same time, towards the end of that, I was losing my computational skills. I was only using one fraction of my skill set, one very small uh, amount of that. And so I started revamping my data science and my bioinformatics skills. I started refreshing, getting new uh, and staying constant, or excuse me, staying current with what was happening in the field and the new advancements, and also refreshing my programming. It's kind of like riding a bike if your programming has lapsed, by the way. Um, and I was thinking about other things that I could do that kind of, you know, when I was going out with people and working with people, getting their feedback, training them, I loved it. And I wanted something similar to that, maybe not necessarily research-based, but so I came to um, technical sales. Yep, I jumped again. So it was a new opportunity. I was curious about it. I inquired from friends that I know that had gone from research to a technical sales uh, in different disciplines, and they loved it. They liked working with, with people and solving problems in that way. And so I had uh, a couple of job offers. I went with IBM and I have had so many opportunities for growth and learning uh, since then. So it, this has really been a wonderful fit and has provided a ton of different opportunities. And that's where we're getting into the quantum computing. So these are all the different courses in my background. Actually, there's a bunch that I've probably forgotten. You can see that most of them are in a STEM field, but a lot of them are, they don't really have anything to do with each other. All of this knowledge, and this is one thing I want you to think about, what knowledge have you had? What courses have you taken? Uh, if you're considering moving into quantum computing from another, from another discipline, what do you have that, that would transfer? So you've heard about transferable skills. It's not just the skills, it's the transferable knowledge. What do all these different fields have in common? How can they inform each other? How can they work together? Um, this is, I have ended up using multiple pieces of this, of all of these different courses throughout my career. Um, they've been, they've been useful. Think about what kind of problems that you want to, uh, what, what you want to solve. Understand what makes good problems for quantum computing. Linear algebra, if you're learning linear algebra, excuse me, if you're learning quantum computing, you definitely want to do a refresh or learn. There's lots of online resources, like Khan Academy and uh, different, uh, different courses that are free on, online for learning these. You have to take stock of what you know and then understand where, where the holes are, you know, what, what problems uh, what, what areas do you need to grow into? What areas do you need to re uh, do you need to refresh? And I do that constantly. Anyways, most of us in science do. We're, we're taught to learn. We're taught to cr critically think. We're, we're taught to grow, right? Um, so you want to think about all your different expertises, especially if you're transitioning from one field to another. What kind of use cases did you see in your previous industries? What kind of use cases or problems did you see in your in your research even that you did in graduate school? And just start brainstorming ideas and areas where you can apply these new technologies. Uh, there's a ton of different online courses and online communities for like, for example, Kiskit has an online community with the textbook. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily gonna try and sell you on, on one different thing. There's uh, the, the MIT X course uh, series on quantum computing, if if you have access to that, is really a very great 
place to to get a, a ground state knowledge, no pun intended. Um, but also, there's another resource. The the ladies here in in this summit, they are in varying stages of knowledge of quantum computing. Some are introductory. Some are just now starting out. Others may have been doing this for several years. We need to help each other. Um, ask questions. A, look for mentors. Look for mentees, and and really start start working um, together as as a field. We are all learning quantum computing. Whether whether it's somebody who's been doing this for years, they're learning new things. People who are starting out are learning a different set of new things. But it's it's new. But we're all learning, and this field is growing and advancing at a rate that we're going to be constantly learning for for a very long time, I think. Um, some of the takeaways, because I know this is a this is a short talk. What do you uh, what do you want to think about, especially students? I want you to think of what you want to do, you know, in the future. You may not know. Take classes in whatever interests you. It has really benefited me. I know that it was. Um, confusing to my parents when when I was in graduate school. What do you want to do with yourself? You keep jumping around and everything. Well, all of that curiosity, that opportunity to explore new things has actually paid off. Um, it has been very helpful, both in research and inventing in several different ways uh, to to actually um, uh, to, to actually uh, take all of those classes. And I'm I'm hoping to have Denise join me. Hello. In just a second. Um, so hopefully Denise is going to come on online shortly. Um, the another thing that I want you to do is just be curious about how you can apply diff new different technologies um, and be open minded about those new technologies. But think critically. Another thing that we're network network inside and outside your field. Hello. Okay. All right. Okay. And remember that everybody who is learning has imposter syndrome. Managers, I want you to think about hiring creative people who think differently and um, have a variety of experiences. That diversity of thought helps to solve problems and anticipate opportunities for growth. So I want you to remember that. And then with that, thank you very much for having me online. And I hope to meet some of you in, in person soon. And if not, I hope to connect online. Thank you very much.